Okay, so my name is Trent Fowler. I'm here on behalf of the Da Vinci Institute, which is a Denver-based uh, futurist think tank. If uh, analyzing the possible impacts of emerging technology sounds like something that would be interesting to you, feel free to check us out on the internet and uh, get in touch with us. So I'm here with Robin Hansen, extremely distinguished uh, author and economist, futurist. You've, uh, you've written books on uh, the impact of uploading human intelligence to computers and, and kind of what that will be like. You've got a new book out, The Elephant in the Brain, which basically tells us that we're, our motives are nowhere near as pure as we like to think they are when we say to other people that they are. Um, so this is hugely exciting to be talking to you. Um, I wanted to start off by asking you, you have a PhD in social sciences, right? I do. Could you tell me a little bit about how that's different from just an economics PhD? Caltech is the school I got a degree from. Yeah. It's a very small department, uh -huh. uh, so there's maybe 20 faculty covering all of social sciences, so I guess they decided I couldn't really uh, give a degree in more specialized topics, so I see. roughly half of my graduate classes and instruction were in political science okay. and half in economics, so um, that's why they call it a social science degree. Cool. And now you're GMU? Now I'm a George Mason University professor. Very nice. Okay, so... I was talking to Nick Beckstead one time, and he told me that he thought more futurists should study economics. You, you get a lot of people, people doing computer science, a lot of people doing nanotech, neurotech. Um, could you say a little bit about your own economics convictions and how that's informed your work on future technologies? It would seem odd to ask for someone's physics convictions, yeah. or even computer science convictions. So even saying the phrase economic conviction is kind of a red flag, as if it's you know, a sort of field that you should have convictions about. Okay, fair enough. I mean, as an intellectual, you're hoping to just, like, embrace the Whatever's convictions true. that are, have the Your convictions should, should align with the truth. And uh, yeah. convictions is a suspicion. Like, it's just like when somebody says, I believe, that's a red flag. You don't need to say, I believe. You just say whatever you say after that. You know, okay. It's implied that you believe it. If sure. somebody says, I believe, that's like a flag about some degree of conviction or emotional right. attachment right. or something like that, which I find suspicious. Uh, so, uh, I'd say uh, I agree with Nick that um, most people who do tech futurism, at least, who are focused on particular future technologies, they tend to have a technology background and they know for a bit about technology. But like myself, often, when, when I was a physics undergraduate, my professors basically said, that other building over there that called social sciences, they're just making it up. There is no such thing as social science. <laughs> That's not a real science. Right. And so, you know, our hard sciences, the real things, and the rest of that is made up. So your own speculations that might come out of the top of your head are as good as anybody's because there is no systematic that's way a fairly, like That's systems. a fairly common sentiment, I think, among the hard sciences. Right, and so uh, I, I, that's just wrong. And uh, that means there's an opening for people to actually use social science to analyze the consequences of technologies. And um, I wrote my book, The Age of M, in part to try to show just how much you could say. Yeah. Because I took a standard scenario that people have long discussed and treated with the attitude you really couldn't possibly know what would happen in that scenario. Right. Exactly. I tried to fill you know, 350 pages full of detail yeah. of all the different things you could say based on standard social science and other sciences in order to convince you that you could do that and maybe shame or inspire people to do other scenarios and that's right. stop. Yeah, well, yeah, and I was I was amazed at just how much mileage you got out of it because near the beginning of the book you say I'm just going to use basic economics. It's a supply and demand, this kind of thing. Yeah. You know? But you you talk about where uh, M cities are likely to be located. You know, in nor uh, near the Arctic Circle where they can get large amounts of uh, of water with ice in it so that it will flow through the pipes in a certain way. And uh, I, I thought in particular one thing that you discussed a lot that was really interesting is the idea of spawning copies of yourself that talk to other copies inside like a safe. So if you meet Donald Trump, he may tell you that I've got great reasons for doing all the things that I'm doing that I can't tell you anything about. Right. Um, but you could spawn a copy, he could spawn a copy, they could go into a safe, and the two copies could talk, he could give you all the state secrets right. he can't divulge, and then your copy could just send out a message saying, I was convinced, or I'm not convinced. Right. And so I just thought that was a fascinating kind of you know, implication of, of the ability to spawn copies of yourself. It's, it's very interesting. And I'm sure I haven't thought through all the implications that are possible to think through. I mean, right. I, I'm trying to think through a whole civilization, and even a couple of years is just not enough time right, to, right. to vividly think it through. That was really interesting. Um, okay, so I have been working on this hypothesis for a while, that there are basically two kinds of futurism. You get what I call technical futurism, not a term I like all that much, but it's kind of the best one I have where you have somebody who knows everything there is to know about the state of artificial general intelligence research. And they sit down and they try to say, here's where the field will be in five years, or here's where the field will be in 20 years. And then you have narrative futurism, 
also not a great term, but basically you're trying to think through the implications of just assuming certain things. You know, so the age of M's kind of struck me as something sort of like that. It's it's the second kind of futurism. I, mean, I think it's obvious that one should be able to distinguish between uh, which particular technology will show up when and in what form, with what costs, mm -hmm. and what are the many social implications that follow from that. that right. That's a clear division of labor. Um, thinking of one as technical and the other as narrative may not be <laughs> may not be fair. Well, it's, it may, it may be slightly true, but it's it's damning in some sense mm -hmm. to suggest that. Uh, People often seem much more interested in futures in the form of fiction, right? Exactly. Than in the form of analysis. Yeah. And many people have complained about age and say, "Couldn't you do this in the form of fiction?" Which, of course, the problem is I'm not trained <laughs> and skilled in that. Well, I couldn't help reading it w without thinking of like fictional scenarios where it would apply. Right. You know? And I have a whole file of notes <laughs> of various fictional elements you could include, but still, um, I, I think there's a sense in which, you know. You, know, you were asking, I think, about you know, a difference between physics and, and social science or mm -hmm. economics, and, and one of the biggest differences is that people care a lot more about social science in the sense they, they fundamentally care about the social conclusions in ways they don't care about the physics conclusions in, in terms of having preconceived conclusions that they would like to be true. In, and having, in terms of the social sciences, they, they yeah, come yeah. to it with preconceived Yeah, yeah they, there are ways they would like the social world to be, there are ways they would prefer the outcome right. to be, and they have value alike, you know, uh, evaluations of various social outcomes, and that's just much less true in physics. So yeah. physics much less has to deal with the potential for people to have agendas that they're pushing on the basis of uh, you know strong emotional associations. That in itself is kind of an interesting question. I mean, do you have any thoughts on why it works out that way? I mean, Katya Grace had a, a blog post where she discussed that a little bit. It's like. The easy subjects, the quote easy subjects, are economics and psychology, the ones that are really hard that we don't know that much about, and the hard subjects are physics where like there's a right answer, you know, like yeah. you, you can sit it down and you can calculate well, it out. There is a right answer in all of these subjects, and all these subjects are complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is the fact that uh, the, the physical world turns out to be surprisingly simple at, at a very elemental level right. in ways that the other worlds aren't, uh, and that's worth noting, but honestly I think the bigger difference is that uh, just we care more about. He said, so some subjects like physics or even math, they don't have to protect themselves as rigorously against agendas and people pushing one thing or another. Yeah. Um, oh, so I, I guess I could clarify a little bit. When I asked about your economics convictions, I mean, w would you describe yourself as, like, are you applying a Keynesian framework? Are you applying, like, an Austrian framework? I mean, there, there are kind of several different approaches to this. It's, it's just really not true. Okay. But, uh, People, I mean, it's, it's a standard sophomoric attitude toward the world of ideas, basically, to imagine that all the major areas of intellectual life are covered by schools that are competing with each other, and each person is a member of a different school, and these schools are arguing a lot. That mostly doesn't happen in most areas of, of the intellectual world, uh, for good reason, thankfully, and that, that's a sign of uh, a failure, really, right, yeah. to be broken down by these schools. There should not be so many ways to ask questions right. or answer well, questions. Especially within the same discipline, having multiple schools, that's somewhat of a failure. I think we, we have multiple disciplines, and we have problems with the different disciplines that don't talk to each other enough, but that's, in a sense, more justified by them having different topic matters. Right. But still, when they overlap, they should try to settle their differences, should and they often, it. then they often don't settle their differences on their overlap areas, right. and that's relevant for the elephant in the brain book, actually. Yeah, in what way? Well, so the um, elephant in the brain book, in essence, em embodies and describes a conflict between two different disciplinary areas, psychology and policy analysis. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Uh, so, uh, that is, we're saying the standard results in psychology uh, suggest that the policy analysis are doing it all wrong. Right. And I've been hoping to get the policy analysis to engage that conflict. How's that going for you? But the book was classified <laughs> as psychology yeah. in terms of its category. It was given to a psychology editor, they had psychology referees were given the book, uh, people who have written reviews of it, to be psychologists, and they've said, uh, yes, we agree, and not only like, isn't this obvious? Like, is this really new? <laughs> well, what's really new here exactly? Maybe it was summarized well and put together well, but yeah. their criticism is more, this isn't really that new. But from the point of view of the policy people, uh, it should be, and, and many of them do say for any one specific thing, if we get them, that this is not at all consensus, but absolutely crazy. That's pretty crazy, yeah. So um, I, I don't remember if it was in the book itself or in an interview you did, but you said you wanted to get institutions to pretend to give people what they pretend to want. 
And I remember thinking, well, how's that going to work? You know, I mean, wouldn't that be fragile? Like, if, if anyone were to expose the pretense, wouldn't it kind of all fall apart? Do you have any thoughts about how you might actually design that? Well, the, the claim is that our existing institutions uh, are institutions by which we pretend to get some things and actually get other things. But that is the status quo. That is the world we live in. Right. The world we live in doesn't look that fragile. So That's true. I, I've got to say that the existence of institutions that pretend one thing and actually do another is uh, quite stable in the world we're Fair in. Enough. Um, but I'd say uh, policy analysts, people who have uh, their job is to do analysis, when they try to imagine reforms, what they have mainly done is taken us at our word for the things we say we're trying to do. Right, I'm trying to be healthy <laughs> and not, I just right. want my family to think that I care enough about right. them to spend a lot of money on right. surgery. And so, uh, or for school, uh, since we talk about school as if it's about learning material, the, uh, policy analysts of education, they tend to focus on analyzing school reforms as if how could we get people to learn more material. And the uh, problem is, if that's not what we really want, then uh, we're not going to be very interested in the reforms, which I think explains why we are actually a lot less interested in social innovation than we are in physics or software innovation. Um, so what I suggest is, instead of coming up with reforms that give people more of the things they say they want that they kind of know they don't actually want, what we need to do instead is design reforms that continue to pretend to give them the thing they say they want, <laughs> while actually giving them more of the things they actually want. So walk me through how that would work in medicine. So uh, people spend a lot on medicine right. as though it's they're, they're trying to become healthier when in fact we know it's you know, expenditures on medicine are not that well correlated with wellness. So what would that look like giving them more of what they think they want to make surgeries more expensive so that they can signal better? What, what would that be like? I don't know exactly, but you'd be looking for a way to restructure medicine so that people could more directly show that they care. Okay. Uh, more personally, more emotionally, more vividly uh, showing that they are concerned and letting other people show they are concerned. Uh, that, uh, however you could do that, that would be better achieving the purpose. There are two kinds of hospitals you could go to, and one of them lets you more directly and clearly show that you care by going there. And the argument is that that will win out in people's hearts as long as you can continue to pretend that both of them are trying to get people healthy. That sounds like a thorny problem. <laughs> but it's the problem that if you can solve something for it, you can optimize institutions and so, so when we design physical reforms, the physical world, uh, in terms of our mechanical devices and electronic devices, they are extremely complicated. Uh, nevertheless, we are still eager for reform and innovation. Uh, and we are willing to pay high costs. So all kind of innovation uh, faces resistance of inertia and people losing the investments in their existing arrangements and having to pay to change to new arrangements. And that is an obstacle to all innovation. But nevertheless, our world pays a lot for physics innovation. That's true. And is eager for them in ways that it isn't for social innovation. And it accepts a lot of complexity. So I, you know, for most of our social institutions, they are vastly less complicated than uh, most of our physical and software devices. So the idea that we are l up against the limit of complexity is just crazy for social innovation. I had never thought of that that way. Yeah, that, that seems plausible. Um, Okay, so I found, you've done several interviews where you're discussing kind of some of these ideas. I, I found the chapters on art and laughter to be especially compelling, and I don't think you've discussed them very much. Could you give us an overview of how signaling works with laughter and an art, and then we can kind of talk about signaling from there? So just to be clear, our book says we have hidden motives, mm -hmm. that in uh, many areas of life, we talk as if we had one motive, and right. that we actually focus on another motive. Right. For many of these areas, but not all, signaling is the motive. Laughter happens to be one of the areas where I might say signaling is not right. a hidden motive, just to be clear. So okay. um, if you ask somebody, why do you laugh, uh, their straightforward answer might be because that's funny. If you say, but what about it is funny, they might point to something that's incongruous or perhaps embarrassing, uh, that changes status levels or something. Uh, but after that, they will stumble to explain what it is that makes something funny. Uh, but it's something that people are doing all the time. Uh, and even the explanations people give don't work very well with many key facts that we know about laughter. So laughter is extremely social. We laugh 30 times more often than we when we are around other people than when we're alone. Uh, the vast majority of uh, laughter has nothing to do with a joke. Yeah. Uh, when there's a speaker and a listener, the, last, the speaker list laughs 50% more often than the listener. And uh, strikingly, we often, through what we laugh at, 
you know, seem to say things we would be horrified to say directly without laughter, such as you know, laughing at a joke about don't drop the soap in a prison shower, right? <laughs> which is funny, but you think, but you Jeez. would never talk about it straight, you know. But yeah, right. You know, yes, because because that sort of callous disregard for the prisoners' welfare uh, seems uh, a mean and cruel, cruel sort of person. But yet, in a joke, you could laugh, and that's okay. So, um, in this chapter, as in most of the book, we are not inventing our own solutions. We are summarizing literatures. Right. And so that's also true here in laughter. Uh, a long literature has you know, honed the idea that laughter seems to be primarily a playsicle. So we humans are constantly um, sometimes serious, sometimes playful. Most animals have a play periods, especially when they're young. And play is usually where you go through the motions of something like hunting or fighting or running or chasing uh, in order to learn the, you know, how to do these things and to just keep in practice. And we humans also do a lot of play, but we are very social creatures, so much of our play is social. Right. And so we play in particular at violating norms and enforcing norms. And so we, we find it funny that uh, when we talk about norm violations, uh, the things we would be horrified to actually do, we uh, are happy and enjoy playing with. And the play signal of laughter uh, is, is the sort of signal you need to show that you are still playing. So when you are, say, play fighting as an animal, you might accidentally bite your opponent. They might hit their head on a rock. And at some point, they might go, ouch. And now you'll both wonder, are we still playing? Right. Because <laughs> if we're really fighting now, I need to change my mode. <laughs> And so you need a way to say, we're still playing, I'm okay. I'm, you know, no, no harm, no foul. Right. And so um, our signal for that largely is laughter. We say, I'm okay, we're still playing. And so we mainly need to laugh when we reach the edge of a place where it might not be clear whether we're still playing. And that's why uh, we laugh so much when we move to the edge of norm violations and things that might, if we weren't playing, so we know when look it's like socially serious, right. uh, and there would be a, something that would violate a rule. And so we like to go to the edge of the rules, and play near the edge of the rules, uh, and find out basically through playing and laughing what the people around us really take seriously, where right. the really lines actually are. Because most of our rules are pretty ambiguous. That's true. They're changing from place to place and time to time. Now, I thought that was really interesting because I mean, we all know humans are social animals. Politics is a hugely important part of life. And even among higher primates that are non-humans, politics can be very complicated. But you, you, your book very concisely explained how a big part of the selection pressure on human intelligence derived from trying to cheat norms. So you've got these rules, and you might think that if the rules were ironclad in any way or unambiguous, right. humans wouldn't need that much brain power. You just don't do X, right. Y, and Z, and you're fine. But if you can figure out ways to cleverly broadcast right. genetic fitness or accrue and, one and it's an arms rules. race on both sides. So on one side, you've you're got trying to, detect to, it. trying to cheat the rules for your rivals who are trying to detect their cheating and prevent it. Uh, so, so our intelligence is on both sides of trying to evade the rules and trying to prevent the evasion of the rules. Uh, but that creates this focus on uh, those various sorts of ways to evade the rules. And then just intelligence skyrockets and 20,000 years later, you've got physics and economics. And well, it may be 100,000 or a million years later. The timing isn't exactly clear, but yes. Okay. So signaling strikes me as a very powerful idea. I mean, looking at human behavior and in institutions through this lens really sheds light on a lot of puzzles that otherwise would be really difficult to explain. Now, if you ask most people, you know, to think about their friends and ask them, how much do they care what other people think about them? Right. Most people will agree that most people do seem to care quite a bit what other people think of them. And you might say, well, to what degree do they choose, like, their appearance or how clean they are or their haircut or their, what they read or, you know, the topics of music they're interested in, with an eye to how other people will think about that. Most do, we'll mostly agree that people do a lot of that. Yeah. And so the, the basic idea that people are doing a lot of things with an eye toward the impressions it makes is, is pretty obvious that very few people would disagree with that. But then there are parts of our lives that we haven't categorized as that. Right. But we've presumed that these other things are done for these other purposes because that's what we all say and they seem kind of obvious. And so the surprising claim of the book is that much of our lives that seems to be something else than showing off is also showing off. Right. Okay. Now, for a couple of years, I've been talking to uh, Eric Raymond about the possibility of writing a book where we 
try to gather together concepts kind of like this, signaling and uh, concepts from especially generative sciences that can be used to uh, export out to a variety of other fields. So astronomy, for example, very beautiful science. It's not particularly generative, though. There aren't that many concepts within astronomy that will uh, make other fields more comprehensible as opposed to evolutionary biology, the concept of descent through selection or fitness functions. Uh, you know, it, it both makes evolutionary psychology more straightforward because it's an application of it, but also it shows up in, in politics and medics and so all sorts of different places. So signaling strikes me as a good candidate for inclusion in a book of that sort. I guess, I mean, it's, that's really a wide scope book to even try to write. Uh, it, certainly our intellectual insights uh, vary in their scope and they vary in the generality. Um, uh, it's, it's a common you know, thing to note that uh, if you learn a more general thing, uh, there's a lot more you can do with it. And so uh, you might do well to start out your intellectual career learning as many general things as you can before you have to start learning all the specific things that uh, don't have as much scope and to just must work to learn. On the other hand, you have to learn some specifics to even understand the generalities. Right. So uh, you should be at least learning whatever specifics will be necessary to learn the generalities. Uh, and these generalities vary a lot from uh, area to area in terms of their scope. Uh, but um, putting all the most general things we know in one book sounds like almost a bridge too far in terms of trying to write a book. It, well, it, it wouldn't be quite that way. It would be more, it, it, it's not just generality. It, it's things that export to other fields. So, and then what you'd want to do is study those concepts and try to apply them in other areas. Well, so the exporting across fields reads this problem that you know many of our most, our biggest failures intellectually uh, are that we don't transfer things across fields. So, I mean, that's the topic of, again, as I said, the elephant in the brain. There's an insight that's seem to be uh, obvious and even you know not worth repeating in psychology that uh, in other fields seems heresy uh, and that happens a lot with a lot of other fields now as it is so for example many other fields disagree with how an economist would think about their topic even though I would say economics is relevant for a great many things uh, people tend to resist the influence of uh, economics uh, I think physicists and brain science scientists are pretty now very sure that the brain is a machine. Yet, I get enormous resistance uh, when I'm about my age at M when just talking about the presumption that the brain is a machine and therefore you could make another machine that had the same functional uh, pattern. Right. Um, so that's a way in which, again, we have failed to pass an insight across disciplinary boundaries. But, I mean, you're a person who, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like you've done rather a lot of that like applying insights across these different areas. And it, it seems to have worked pretty well for you. You're very productive. Well, but in a sense, the way I do that is by myself just being in multiple disciplines. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Am I as open to insights from another discipline that I haven't studied? I might be as guilty as anyone uh, of not appreciating the insights that come from across a boundary. So you just study every field. It, That's right. It so, appears as though you've <laughs> taken that. Well, I'm trying time. to study a lot of fields. I, I am limited. Uh, so many of my talks, I give this map of academia of all the major areas connected by links where they cite each other a lot, and it's a circle, actually. And most of my work is done on one half of the circle. So biology and medicine, uh, and chemistry down there, or there and geography, there's whole worlds of detail down there that they don't have as many abstractions. They're just lots of detail, and, and my mind is just not well suited for right, managing saying. all that detail. I, I like to stay over near math and computer science and economics and physics, which are all uh, fields that really rely a lot on abstractions. I once went to a uh, meeting with a lot of doctors who were in a scholars program. It was a sister program to my program, and I learned that doctors are spectacular at remembering detail, and they were really bad at abstraction. <laughs> and so, us on the other side of the circle, I'm one of those people who's just really bad at remembering detail. Well, I mean, if, if you're good enough at the abstractions, I think you can probably fill the details in later as long as you... Well, in some areas, not in biochemistry and medicine. No, no. <laughs> you really need to master the detail. Yeah, that's just, true. You don't need to be cutting over the heart. <laughs> you know, a few abstractions are just not going to do it for you there. <laughs> okay, so this is something I, I found out about you, I think it from the elephant in the brain, but you just went to Stanford? You just walked in the door and started taking classes? Uh, right. What was that like? I mean, you were working it at NASA straight forward. Yeah. Okay, so okay. what did you focus on anything in particular? or Did anybody ever call you out on that? So um, I graduated from University of Chicago around uh, 1984, and then I went out and found a job at Lockheed doing artificial intelligence after a year or so. And after uh, two years at Lockheed, 
I decided that what I wanted to do was um, you know, more intellectual exploration. And so I basically said, look, I've proven my productivity here, and I'm a 40-hour a week employee. How about I work 30 hours for a three-quarter pay, and then I can have more time to explore things. And that, of course, took me immediately off the management fast track. But uh, then I just had a lot of time to explore. And so I uh, had access to the Stanford Library uh, just through my jobs. And then it was natural to uh, think about sitting in on classes. Which ones did you take? Just anything? Well, wide range. Um, I, I took an experimental economics class that then I asked the professor to write a letter of recommendation for me, which he did, which helped me get into graduate school when I finally went back to school. I uh, sat on some philosophy classes, sat a, a bit on uh, John McCarthy, teaching uh, a little computer science issues class. Very nice. Um, so, I mean, having studied all these fields, do you have any thoughts on the correct way to order them to sort of, I guess, streamline the process as much as possible? Like, I mean, so you've, you've meandered, I, I think it's yeah. fair to say. I mean, do you wish that you had known more economics first, or do you wish you'd said a little bit more math first and then gone out to it? Could you have, could you have at all optimized this? I really don't know. Uh, I certainly think that um, there's some truth to, I think, you know, I think Plato has an order of the disciplines he suggests you go through. And it does have you want to go through maybe math and physics before you get to social sciences. I, th I think there is a sense in which it's harder to understand social sciences until you've had more experience with the actual world. And so for that point of view, it makes more sense to do social sciences later in the order. And uh, makes some sense to do, say, physics early because you don't actually have to need to understand very much about the world to just do the math yeah, and, and get the key physics concepts. Um, and then you sort of see what it looks like to know a lot about something. Right. I've, uh, I I've noticed that there seem to be a lot more math prodigies, young math prodigies, than there are history or economics prodigies or social science prodigies. One thing, it may just be harder to identify them. Right. Hard to show that you're a prodigy. True. It, but but it, it also could be the case that it's just kind of hard to understand history without a certain amount of life experience. It's not hard to read the book and remember when the battles were, but understanding how George Washington must have there, felt. There, there is a literature on different subfields being ones where innovation more comes from a big conceptual reorganization versus where places where innovation comes more from just accumulating a lot more detail. Yeah, concept heavy fact or right. concept heavy fields versus just yeah. ones where you know many of the basic concepts but it's right. filling in the picture. And so people reach the peak of their careers later in the second kind of field where it's more about accumulating details. You just have to spend a longer time accumulating enough details in order to be able to put them together in interesting ways. Whereas uh, in the concept-oriented fields, uh, you can master the concepts earlier in life and then have a chance of, of doing some interesting reorganization of things. Okay, so switching gears just a little bit, I wanted to ask if you had any updates to your comments with the original AI Foom debate that you had with Elias Um there, there have been some really fascinating things happening with AlphaZero architecture. It, right. it went from being the best Go software to rewriting itself and and becoming some of the best chess software ever. And uh, so I, I don't know who's heard what, so I more feel like I should just like start from scratch and quickly summarize the point of view. Violence. It, that that <laughs> right, was a right. long debate. That ebook right. is like 800 right. pages long. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll say, you know, there are, I see two main issues. One I think is uh, overwhelmingly likely to be an issue. And the other I think is overplayed as an issue. Uh, it's not a zero probability, it's just a little exaggerated. The issue that I think is overwhelmingly likely to be an issue is an issue, or even if you ignore AI, it's just the issue that your descendants uh, are likely to have values that differ from yours. Right. Uh, this is what has happened all through history up until now. Uh, our brains don't implement our values in a really stable way that's you know, modular and isolated for the rest of our brains. And culturally, we, we embody a lot of our values and culture. So culture evolves, and our, our environments evolve, and the education evolves, and the way we're raised evolves, and that all influences our values. And so over time, uh, values have changed. And you should expect that to continue in the future. In addition, you should expect it to happen faster as rates of change are faster. And we've seen a pretty steady or a consistent trend toward faster rates of change. And so that means you should expect to see more of that sort of change within any given time period in the future than you've seen in the past. And it could be a lot. So in my book, The Age of M, I say we've seen these three great eras in the past. Uh, of humans at least. Uh, before humans, there were animal brains doubling roughly every 30 million years. Uh, 
during humans period, uh, human culture uh, population doubled roughly every quarter million years during the forage era, roughly every thousand years during the farming era, then roughly every 15 years lately. And uh, if another transition happened, it would happen plausibly within a century to a doubling time of every month. So if you have a sudden, if, if the, our descendants start doubling every month, and there's still humans around who have our sorts of lifespan, within a lifespan, they will see enormous amounts of change. And that would encompass enormous amounts of value change. Uh, to the extent that you are scared by where that value change could go, you have an extremely le legitimate fear. And I don't have much of an assurance of what I can, uh, how you can avoid that, really. Now, if our descendants are biological, or our descendants are robotic, or our descendants are human mind emulations, or there's some more artificial mind, in any of those places, you still should expect as a default, a lot of value change over a relatively short time. But and if you think that's terrible, that's a big problem. So I want to grant that that is a, is a legitimate concern. So the version of that where the descendants are AI, that is a version of the AI risk concern, which is to say, by default, the AI's values will drift away from the values we prefer now, and that's a problem. Uh, but in a sense, I'd say it's equally a problem for all the other kind of descendants we could have, as long as change is fast, then it would generically just drift away. So that's the problem I think is overwhelmingly likely to remain to be a problem. And if you think that's unacceptable, then you're stuck in the case of trying to prevent the past from continuing to the future, finding a way to make our future descendants no longer have this usual process of having their values drift as culture changes and context changes. You want to find a way to make those descendants no longer changing their values that way, finding a way to reconstruct their minds or to create modularity boundaries or to prevent change by locking in something that doesn't change however however you want to do it so that you don't play out that snark. Uh, that seems very challenging to me and dangerous to me, but I got a grant that if you're really scared by where generically value drift would go, then you have a problem. Now, some of this comes down to how specific are your values. So you know, generically, you should just expect a random walk in a lot of different dimensions. Now, if you find yourself able to encompass generously to see the value in uh, descendants that have a wide range of future potential values, then this is less of a concern to you. Right? The more that you think the thing you care about is really narrow and specific, then more likely this random walk will drift away from it and then you're in trouble. Okay, so, so, so that's the thing I think is the reasonable concern. The, the other one is the one more related to the AlphaGo consideration. Okay, well, I definitely want to talk about that, but okay. I, I just want to push back a little bit on this idea because I, I think the AI alignment people, the people who are afraid of that, they understand that cultural evolution, and especially cultural evolution in an accelerated, uh, in a context where you know the economy is doubling every month or every year, you know, in an EM upload scenario, would obviously be pretty significant. There'd be a lot of drift. But you're still sampling from a, a human compatible goal space as opposed to developing like an AGI, a super intelligence that's maximizing the number of paper clips in the universe. That's something much more radical and, and I guess far more dangerous. I'm less worried that my great, great, great grandchildren will be radically different from me than I am that a, a, an ethical architecture and AI would I be think different. that's largely carbon chauvinism. Uh, making the presumption that our human descendants, wherever they go, they would still be human and therefore not worrying, I, I think is to underestimate just how far humans can go. <laughs> we are really pretty culturally plastic. Uh, your descendants can really go a long way away from what we are and what we have been. I, I don't think you should be that assured by the fact that they would be carbon-based, that they couldn't go very far in distance in the space of values. Um, similarly, I don't think you should be extra concerned that much that something made out of silicon or some other element will go much farther away from what it is to be human just because it's made out of silicon. I mean, if we make artificial intelligence, uh, they will be made by humans. I mean, we will be imprinting ourselves onto them in a thousand little ways as we construct them. And not only that, as we make them and then see how they behave, we will be uh, teaching them and, and reining them in in various ways in order to keep them even more in time with us. Not just because they will come from us, but because they will be integrated in our society. They will have to sit in slots that humans used to sit in socially. They will have to sit in those roles and behave the way something like a human would have in order to be sensible and understandable. And through all those mechanisms, they will be not too far away from what humans would be, but I also say what humans can be is a pretty, lot. Pretty strange. <laughs> it should yeah. go a long way. So you're not at all worried about a hard takeoff scenario? So the hard takeoff scenario, again, there's the second scenario that okay. I'm less concerned about. Okay. Uh, 
So that there's two elements of takeoff to distinguish. One is the speed, and the other is the locality. Right. Okay. So I've just been addressing speed so far, and I'm sitting and saying you should expect faster change, and that means you are going to be more concerned about the change you will see in a short time, and that's completely legitimate. I have, I've, I, I expect, as I described in the age of M, speed will, you know, change will speed up, and uh, a lot will happen, and if you don't speed up with the change, and you're on the margins, you will just end up seeing a lot of change, and you won't have much control of it. Right, and that's just. I can't offer you much assurances. A way, a way to get out of that. Sorry, not, that's not a rosy see. picture. <laughs> I got to tell it like I see it. That's that's how I see it. Um, then the locality of the uh, change. That's a separate issue. So the way I'd like to frame it here, and then you can push back as you like, is it's about the frequency of lumpy versus large lump versus small lump innovation. So. We have uh, literature and, and data about innovation and in technology in the last thousand years. We also have data about innovation in business, uh, innovation in all sorts of fields, uh, innovation in biology even as well. And the general pattern we see is uh, there's something like a power law, a long thin tail of the size of innovation. And um, so there are some innovations that are really big and lumpy that will all by themselves make a big change. And you might say like the nuclear weapon as, as a lumpy innovation. You, you don't have a small bomb. Right. If you have one, it's a big bomb. It's big. And it makes a big impact then, okay? And so that's a lumpy innovation. Uh, but in almost all the data sets we, we see, uh, the vast majority of the integral of value is in the many small changes. So if you look, say, at a, a history of locomotives, <laughs> And every year, how fast or cheap the lo locomotives could go with how much energy, you will find that it's a wiggly graph, but most of the steps are small. Every once in a while, there's a big step. Uh, but the sum total of all the small steps is much bigger than the sum total of the big steps. So generically so far, through almost anything we've ever seen, most innovations uh, has varying degrees of lumpiness, but the big lumps tend to have a small influence overall. But every once in a while, they happen and they're important. That's innovation in general. Now, we look toward the future, the prospect of developing artificial intelligence and various sorts of uh, innovations in computers and uh, other related devices and social changes there. And uh, if that trend continues, then you should expect uh, future changes to still also be mostly lots of small changes with a few big lumps now and then. Um, and that would mostly be a relatively gradual, continuous change. Um, and a related issue is you know, the degree to which any one small part of the world uh, contributes to that. So uh, when change is lots of little changes, then any one small part of the world so far contributes a small part. And uh, if you isolate yourself from the rest of the world, you lose out because uh, it is all sharing things with each other. If you don't share with it or gain from it sharing, then you would grow a lot less. So there's scale advantages in being part of a large world sharing innovations. And that's uh, been true in the past. Uh, now, the advantages of being able to share innovations are limited by uh, barriers to sharing. Right. So, for example, among species, uh, among mammals in particular, um, a, a species can be a boundary to sharing. Now, in, in other kinds of uh, life out there, actually, they share innovations across a wider range. Bacteria actually are able to share innovations across a pretty wide range of bacteria types, which is uh, somewhat amazing. But uh, humans uh, have this limit. So. Um, when this, you know, you might have a species innovating, and then other species are being outcompeted because the innovations can't cross the species boundaries as well. Although humans did mate with some other related, closely related species, let's just Neanderthals and Paleozoans, um, but still, you know, there's this effect of shared. So, when we're looking to the future, uh, one scenario is this local foom scenario. So we've said, I've said, you know, fast change is very plausible, but one scenario of concern is the scenario where one small part of the world finds a lumpy innovation that then allows it to become vastly more capable than the entire rest of the world put together. Um, and so the question is the plausibility of that and uh, concerns for that. So um, if you just think about the distribution of innovation in the past, the idea that one small part of the world uh, could find an innovation that would make it more powerful than the entire rest of the world put together uh, is very unlikely <laughs> on the simple grounds that uh, Innovations that big are extremely rare, um, but uh, it's logically possible, of course. 
Uh, one, if you look at in the past history at the biggest innovations we ever saw, because you, you're looking for this extreme tail, right. um, it's noteworthy that the biggest innovations we ever saw were primarily innovations that, that changed the growth rate, but didn't actually change capacity at the time. What do you mean? So uh, whatever it is that made humans different didn't suddenly make humans much more capable. It allowed humans to accumulate innovations faster. So culture is the standard best explanation. The ability of humans to share uh, I, uh, practices by copying each other and guiding each other even, and that copying was an innovation that allowed humans to uh, collect innovations through culture much faster than genetics, which is what the other animals were accumulating innovations via. So that innovation of culture was large enough to have enormous effects, uh, but it was primarily an innovation in the rate of change. As soon as humans had culture, they weren't much more capable than the other humans who didn't have culture. Right. Well, it was the accumulation over time of the innovation they could then collect. Right. So, so it's sort of a meta innovation. It's an innovation in innovation. For innovations. Right. Um, so that's, I, I guess, the question I kind of want to ask is in these scenarios that I've read about, you've got an AI rewriting itself and changing the underlying architecture. So the power law analysis primarily applies to you know, organisms like us where the underlying capacity is not being changed. Like the algorithms by which we have insights are not changing as we learn so, insights. So I would say the default scenario to imagine is a large world with many teams and groups, all of whom have access to similar levels of AI technology. Uh, that is, they've been reading the journals and going to the conferences, et cetera, and uh, trying to reverse engineer other people's demos. And so uh, many teams have similar technology for producing uh, software and robotics. And so whenever it becomes possible for these systems to change themselves, uh, they all have that ability. In fact, we have that ability now. <laughs> People already know how to make systems that change themselves. The hard part is to make them change well. Right, to, to get it where the, the recursion doesn't grind out after two right, right. So, so um, again, you, know, you don't have to be too specific, but you're looking for an innovation in the ability to improve itself of some sort. Uh, some, but that's only one kind of innovation. You could just have an innovation of finding an algorithm, a, a great algorithm for learning or something. And the key point is, at some point in the scenario, one small part of the world finds this very lumpy innovation. It's so lumpy that allows uh, this one system to grow much more quickly or suddenly just to be much more capable. And then it can start to take advantage of that advantage faster than others could copy and, and take advantage and learn its advantages. So, you know, in our world, nations have sometimes had advantages over other nations in terms of they might invent a military technology that other nations don't have, and then they can, for a time, uh, take advantage of that until other nations acquire those innovations, typically through diffusion, i.e. through copying the other innovations. So we have to imagine this future scenario where there's one team that acquires an innovation, and then it takes advantage of that innovation uh, over a long enough time to be able to really grow a lot or just be a lot faster than the other teams could uh, copy. So, so in our history, you know, the, the three biggest innovations that have ever happened, I would say, were the introduction of human culture, the introduction of farming, and then the introduction of industry. And in these three cases, they were all changes in the growth rate. None of them immediately gave much advantage. They all were a meta innovation in the, in the yes. ways that you could accumulate more innovation. They were all probably mostly a way to diffuse innovation better as opposed to make invention better. It's not about inventing, it's more about diffusing innovations, all three. And um, over time, the degree of neighbors near an originator to copy and complement the original has increased. That is, the original human species, uh, the competitor species were not very much able to copy or complement the original human species. The original human species basically mostly wiped out the others, except you know, taking some of their genes. Whereas with farming, it was more like a 50-50 split between uh, new farmers moving into an area and displacing the old foragers, and the old foragers copying the new farmer ways. So there was a substantial advantage for the new, but it wasn't an overwhelming advantage. And in the Industrial Revolution, it was an even smaller advantage that Europe, Northern Europe had. First of all, you know, the city Edinburgh that may have started the Industrial Revolution, it did not dominate the world. It complemented the rest of Great Britain 
which then grew together, but which complemented the rest of Northern Europe, and so on. And then eventually complemented the world. So the rapid rate of complementarity and sharing meant that the Industrial Revolution, the first place to have the Industrial Revolution, did not take over the world on net, although it had substantial influence, out of disproportionate influence, but it was still even less proportionate gain than, than in the farming revolution. So we're looking toward this future and imagining some something far, finding a new innovation that's analogous to industry uh, or farming or culture and asking ourselves, well, how far could it take that advantage? Uh, and could that be much more than we've seen in the last few great transitions? Yeah, well, in, in this case, it, it would be like if, you know, if in the United States we invented surgery, you could get the double your IQ, and then those people became neuroscientists. So you, you're changing the underlying process in an important way. So this has kind of a, a cascading effect. Where All of the great revolutions changed the underlying process in an important way. That's why they were the great revolutions. Yeah. You can't be a great meta-revolution without, importantly, changing an well, underlying true, process. True, but you're not making the humans doing it smarter. They're not significantly smarter than they were. Well, in a sense, we literally are significantly smarter in, in the literal sense of being able to do more. Um, it, you know, if you define smartness in a certain sort of way where you factor out all our cultural advantages, <laughs> you put people, person in an isolated booth and you say they don't have any different education and they don't have any different tools and now you judge them, well, that part may not have changed so much. But of course, we are smarter because we have all these tools and culture and education, et cetera. Well, sure, and that's not trivial. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to trivialize that, but I think just to capture the intuition around the theme scenario, it's it's not just that you learn math earlier, it's that you've got 80 additional IQ points. Like, you are significantly smarter, or an eidetic memory. And, and that is just, that's okay, a significant but advantage. The engineers in Edinburgh were significantly better engineers than the engineers in the rest of the world because they had the Industrial Revolution. True. And that was an important advantage, and it gave them an advantage over the world. It just wasn't an overwhelming advantage. Right. So, so imagine in the course of doing their engineering work, now instead of being limited to the seven plus or minus two that most humans are in terms of their working memory, now they can think about fifteen things at one time, or they can visualize four dimensions. You can see this How much getting of a difference. Would that really make though? Well, it depends on what you're working on, I guess. Yeah. But, but if if you had some way to introspect in a deep way and kind of rearrange the algorithms that you're using to arrive at insights, I could see that getting out of hand pretty fast and leading to world domination. But can you see it letting one team get so much better than all the others? That is, uh, if you have an innovation in how to rewrite your code, if other people find that innovation in how to rewrite the code, then they will also have that advantage, etc. That's true. So, yeah. so the question is, really in this locality scenario, how much can one small team gain an advantage relative to all the others? I suppose that depends on a couple of different factors. So if it's one of those things where 99% of the puzzle is not enough, but that last additional insight is enough to get the, the ball rolling, then I think you could have local dominance in that way. Well, but even when you have this lumpy insight, still the question is how far do you get before other people can copy it? There's a, there's a time scale, right? Well, what if you stumble on it and you don't realize that, that you've kind of completed the puzzle and, and it sort of gets going on its own? The other teams may not realize how close they are. So in my estimate of doubling times, I would say, uh, given the trend of doubling times, the next plausible doubling time would be, say, a month. So imagine you find an innovation that lets your system improve itself on a doubling time of a month. Uh, it finds this lump, and now it can double every month. Uh, that means in five months, it can grow by a factor of two to the five or 32. Uh, is that enough to take over the world? No, but it, it could be enough to be smart enough to deceive us, to to underplay the magnitude of the improvements it's making, to make copies of itself, to... So but you have to ask, you know, what would be the typical time scale under which people in this project would have rumors with people in other projects and people would it's hear about the say. development it's, it's and then other say. people would, would be eager to try to guess, like, what did they do, try to reverse engineer it, et cetera, and, and again, this is the competition. But, I mean, this has been what we've seen in all these past great revolutions. Uh, there have been a, something found something new, and then others around who didn't have anything were eager to either copy it or complement it. And so far, uh, you know, with the initial human revolution, uh, that made an enormous inequality that the first humans dominated because, again, the other species really couldn't complement or copy very well. And you have to hypothesize that this future very lumpy innovation not only happens, it uh, has this property that uh, others can't very easily copy or to complement. And so, um, you know, to me, that seems like you're you're piling along, piling on a lot of pretty unlikely hypotheses to produce your scenario, which makes it, it a priori pretty unlikely. That, that could be true. I, I think just for me personally, it's the stakes could be high enough. It's probably worth thinking about. 
Okay, but you might even ask, so I'd say, if I'm going to look for what would cause a growth rate that could make us double every month, I think we already know what it is, actually. We have it in economic theory. We know that our current growth rate of our economy is today limited by the fact we can't grow people very fast. We know that we can grow capital very fast, but we have diminishing returns to the value of capital. And so um, there's not much point in making capital grow fast if you don't have people to match them with. Once you can make substitutes for people in factories, that limitation goes away, and it's quite plausible the economy could double every month with that one change, which is to say, we actually know plausibly what could cause the next great jump in growth rates. It, it, we already know that one thing we expect to happen when we have robots that can substitute for people is a change that would make a size change in the growth rate of the sort we've seen in the past. Okay. That is, there's not a missing factor to be explained. We, we, we already have a plausible hypothesis of what would cause that change. And so now, now you can make the, the scenario more specific. You say, what happens if one place in the world develops the ability to make its robots grow faster because they can have substitute for workers in, in the factory, right? So all they really need is a thing that can substitute for humans. It doesn't have to be superhuman. It could just be something that's as good as human that you could make in a factory. That's all it takes for that, part, that new part of the economy to start doubling every month. And now you can ask, say it does start doubling every month, but it starts out pretty small. So it starts out, say, at one millionth the size of the current economy. Well, then it needs uh, 20 doublings in order to become as big as the rest of the economy. So then the question is, what's the chance that the rest of the world will find out within 20 doublings about this process and then either complement it or copy it? Okay. So uh, do you think that the value alignment problem is maybe less of a problem than people are making it out to be? Is it, is it well, worth kind of doing research on? As I said, the first problem that we talked about, I think, is overwhelmingly likely. Okay. That can be described as a value alignment yes. problem, if you like. The second problem we talked about is a, is a version where you say the value alignment problem will strike you very fast, very hard, because there will be one very small part of the world which will have some particular values, and then it will very quickly grow. And then its random walk will be the random walk that we all face. So it's a conjunction of this random walk going away and far out of control and the fact that there's this random sample for one small part of the world and whatever its values happen to be. And those are the two steps of changing the value. And, and you're point. skeptical about the ability of the recursive process to grab enough traction to get out of hand so quickly that it becomes a kind of a world catastrophic potential? I, I'm less uh, concerned about one small part of the world suddenly taking over the world. Uh, but I don't think it's a zero likelihood, but I just think in either case, you have this generic problem of random walk and values that's true, drifting away from what you might find safe or comfortable. And uh, again, I don't have good solutions to offer that. So many people are basically hoping that we could make a kind of AI that you can have proofs about, that you can guarantee that its values won't right. drift. Uh, of course, which is you know nothing like the sort of creatures we are or right. a culture that we're embedded in. Uh, so they may be very strong modularity. There's a part of the system that contains the values. The rest of it doesn't contain the values. The rest of it can't change the value part of the system. The value part of the system makes sure that those values don't change. And then furthermore, the values that it has that don't change are good ones. Right. Which are, of course, very hard to specify. So you, you know, you're piling on a lot of requirements here. Of course, then you have to require that you can make the team that does the whole system first be the one that has it according to the rules you've set, which may add costs to setting it up that way, and then you, you've made an even harder problem. It's a, it's a hard problem. <laughs> Daunting, <or> overwhelming <laughs> even. <laughs> okay, so a, a slightly different question on the same topic. Um, I've read a lot recently about the possibility of eventually robots coming for all the jobs. Now, I don't think anybody's worried about that in 10 or 15 years, but I mean, do you Good. think that we could arrive at a, at a place in 100 or 200 years where there really just isn't so much for humans to do anymore, even for artistry, there's you know sex robots now, we might not even be required for that. I mean, and if, and if we arrive at that point, what are we gonna do all day? So, the rate of change at the moment is relatively slow. I, I don't think we're actually seeing rates of automation change now that are much different than we've seen for the last 100 years and plausibly that would continue for a long time. One scenario is that the rate of automation and displacement is the same for the next few centuries as it's been for the last century, in which case it will take several centuries for most of the jobs to be displaced. Um, 
Then uh, there are other scenarios where, say, a more sudden transition can happen. There could be some big lumpy innovation in artificial intelligence that we've been talking about, where in suddenly in a short period, they all, all the job in this place. There's the age of M scenario, the art of emulation scenario, wherein brain emulations are the ones who displace humans. Um, in any of these scenarios, uh, the end point is ones where ordinary biological humans are displaced out of the jobs, at least in terms of being able to compete for them and earn wages. Um, but humans start out basically owning all the capital in this world in any of these scenarios. And so collectively, uh, if the economy starts growing faster, they get rich faster. So, uh, and we, we've seen people who didn't have to work in history, and they seem to have been OK and enjoying themselves. And we roughly know what they do. It's not a mystery. It's not a strange scenario. We know what rich people do when they're rich enough not to have to work. Do you seen, think, we've seen a lot of that. Right. Do you think that will be spread enough out among all of humanity for everyone to kind of enjoy that kind of lifestyle? I mean, there well, will be poor people, uh, The right? easy prediction is there will be a lot of variation in, this, in the degree of insurance with respect to this risk. So uh, this is a risk, i.e., most people don't own that much today besides their ability to work. Between now and such an event, they need to acquire some insurance or sharing arrangements. If they don't, they are at risk of starving unless they get charity. So those people who create sufficient sharing and insurance arrangements will they will do okay because they have the resources. Those who don't, won't. These things have just consistently varied in history, so it seems to me a safe prediction to say they will vary in the future, especially with respect to this event. Yeah. Right? Right, no, I'm, I think you're probably right. I just, th that strikes me almost as but may, maybe a harder problem. So, but to me, there's a more interesting question, whoa, and that's inspired by the age of M thinking, which is once human brain software is no longer tied to the hardware that we have in our heads, it has better chance of competing with other artificial software. And so then humans have a potential legacy at work of creating, being the origin of descendants who are competitive on jobs, even if they are substantially modified from what human minds are like. Uh, I don't think it's obvious that artificial software wins in all the jobs, or even most of the jobs. Uh, and so they can speed humans up, you mean, or if we didn't well, have to take well, once we're in artificial hardware, well, right. you can speed up or slow down. You can move to different hardware. Then you augment can, memory, maybe. Right, and you can change, reorganize the brain in some ways. Uh, there's just a lot of possibilities there. Um, here's an interesting analogy. Um, biology uh, had single-celled or organisms for a very long time. And then at some point, there was the niche opened up to have larger organisms. Now. Uh, before that, biology had honed these little packages of cells to be remarkable integrated packages of features. Each little cell needs to do everything a little organism has to do by itself out in the wild. It has to be self-sufficient. And then it has to just do all that in one little package. And then all these little parts that do all these little things have to not step on each other. And they have to work well together. And evolution just took a long time to make a really well integrated package of a cell. Now, once larger cells were possible, uh, they could have just tried to extend the design for a small scale cell and just scale it up. And actually, small scale cells actually do vary over at least a factor of 100,000 in terms of volume. <laughs> and so they actually do range over a thing. But they're even there, the, the scale over which they can range is limited. And evolution found that um, it wasn't very effective to take a cell size design and just scale it up to a large organism. Now, it could have just tried to redesign a large organism from scratch in the way it had, had designed the small organisms from scratch. But once it had those units. But once it had those units, it was more efficient to just paste them together, which is remarkably inefficient if you realize that a multicellular organism with the cells pasted together, each cell is almost capable of surviving in the wild. There's enormous redundancy of the capacities of all these cells they can sense, they can, you know, they can manufacture, they can detect and repair, they can do all these things all by themselves. And evolution pasted those together to make multicellular animals. And the obvious explanation is, you know, when you have a package that's really well honed to work together, rather than spending a whole, you know, long time with a big search to find some other package on a different scale, you might be tempted to just paste the packages together. Okay, now go to the future, where you have human brain software in artificial hardware, and you, have, it together. and you have other kinds of artificial hardware. The human brain, if you think about the evolution of it, when we write software today, we have a bunch of old software, and we start on a new problem. And what we usually do is make a blank page and write a new piece of software. We may pull some tools out of the old, but it's mostly a new piece of software. That's because we have lots of blank pages. When the human brain was evolving, it did not have blank pages. The human brain combines hardware and software together in a key way, which means you'd have to add more hardware to add more software, and there's not much room for more hardware. So when evolution evolved the brain, it was mainly limited to rearranging <laughs> the stuff in there in a more effective and efficient way rather than adding new stuff. 
Whereas when we write software, we can just add new stuff. And adding new stuff and keeping the dependencies low is our main way to, to manage the complexity. It's called modularity in software. But evolution couldn't do that. Right. It, it therefore had this not modular, but very well integrated package in our brain. That's a lot like a cell. And it might take evolution or us a long time to come up with a package that's that well integrated that competes with the package in a human brain. And so you may have just pasting these human brains together in a large unit to produce future software um, you know, systems. And you might say, the usual story is, well, the human brain has all these things you don't need. Surely it would be more efficient just to make smaller pieces of software that just did the task you need without all these extra things the human brain has. But that's exactly the argument against the single cell Cells in a multicellular. But it worked system. once. You know, it worked once in history, in the history of life. So perhaps it will work again. So that's a reason to think that humans aren't obviously obsolete. That is, our software in our heads could have descendant software that does a lot of work. That still might be different from us in many yeah. ways. And that's a whole other. That's not question. exactly what people mean when they talk about not being obsolete. Well, but we are really quite different than our ancestors. That's true. You have to realize if our ancestors from 100,000 years ago had looked at us and they had been asked, well, humanity survived, didn't it? They might go, well, I'm not so sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> they would be less sure that we really embody all of the things they valued. Mm -hmm. We have changed a lot. So do you not buy the modularity thesis with respect to the mod? I mean, it sounds like you're repudiating that. It's a matter of degree of modularity. I mean, you, you can't decide anything that will have some degree of modularity, but you know, as we know today, there are large old legacy software systems, and one of the hallmarks of legacy software systems, they have slowly become less modular over time. That's what happens with legacy systems. As you modify them, you slowly create more dependencies, and it's just really hard to maintain the modularity at the degree you had before. There's still a lot of modularity compared to a random arrangement of code, but modularity gets sacrificed for other things over time. And as I said, for the brain, you expect that the cost of modularity would have been even larger because you just couldn't add new modules on the side. You had to rearrange the stuff you had. So you know, all systems have some degree of modularity. It's about how much. When we write code, modularity is our power, most powerful tool. So we really have a lot of modularity in the code we write. Um, now that raises an interesting question, which is someday in the future, the software we write, we'll be able to write other software. How modular will that software be? You can think of it as meta software. So, right. You know, there's, there's brains wrote software and software writes other software. So there's a difference between our brains and the software in it and the software we write. Will that difference be also reflected in the meta software we write? The, the software we write is also uh, rots faster than the software in our heads uh, in a way we've not fully accounted for why. But uh, the software in our heads does rot slowly in the sense that as we get older, our minds get more fragile and then they're harder to, uh, harder to learn new things, etc. But the software we write seems to rot even faster than that. You mean it, it becomes unusable or...? It, it, it slowly acquires dependencies and fragility. Oh, so when multiple people work on it, right. they, they patch even, even over... Even just when one person works on it. Well, yeah, over time. So they, they patch, patch it together and they right. bring in It might have started with a nice, elegant to design, but then over time various unexpected contingencies meant they had to violate the assumptions of the initial design, and that's how most systems go. Okay. Um, and so there's this interesting question of, of meta software, well, software squared if you will, or how modular will that be, how fragile will it be? Um, but these are the kinds of things that I think about when I think about the future of software. Uh, so this is part of a, a project that I have at the moment funded by the Open Philanthropy Foundation where I've, been, I, I've made the pitch that I did an analysis of the brain emulation scenario in the age of M, and then I would do a different analysis of a different scenario. And so the alternative scenario, as I pitched it, is to say, assume that eventually we get uh, software as smart as people through just the accumulation of more better software the way we've been doing for 70 years with no great revolutions. What does that world look like? And so that gives you a concrete assumption you can work with to try to predict how the world changes. And so these are some of the issues that, that come to mind. That's very fascinating. Um, okay, so switching gears again, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Great Filter. So I watched your TED Talk on the Great Filter. Um, it's a really cool idea. Well, it's a terrifying idea. It's a nice encapsulation of just how terrible you know, the future could possibly be. Uh, but I kept wondering to myself as I was watching your explanation of it, uh, isn't it the case that we really haven't been looking that long for signals from space. So your argument hinges on the fact that, well, it, it hinges on the Fermi paradox. The idea that if the universe is a huge place, it's very old, 
we surely would have seen signals by now. Like somebody would have invented radio, we'd be getting TV signals. Well, it's much less about signals than just seeing them and you know the products of their being there. Uh, you know, when, when you go visit Brazil, uh, you, you're not looking for signals from the trees, the rainforest. You're, you're just seeing the rainforest. It's just there, right? Okay. Uh, and it's using resources, and it's it's in the way, right? Uh, that's the sort of thing you should expect life in the civilization to do. If it's a billion years old and spread out from some point in the universe, it would just be using stuff, and using stuff in, a, in an intense way usually means you rearrange it, you change it from its initial conditions. So. The fact that almost everything we see is very consistent with it never having been touched uh, is, is, is surprising. Uh, that is, we have models of what happens when stars just form out of nothing with no particular help or shepherding, and uh, you know how what the evolution of the solar system looks like that, and when it dies, and the stuff we see all looks consistent with our models of dead stuff, stuff that was always dead, that never had any help from anything alive. Uh, and that's the puzzle. Why is it all so dead? So, could you give me some examples of things we would see if that were not the case? I mean, like stars flashing in prime number sequences, or what, what exactly do you have in mind when you say that, uh, like, if you picture a, a civilization that's a billion years old expanding outwards, what would we see them doing? I mean, assuming they didn't just show up. They take apart their star. <laughs> okay. Make something else out of it. We, are, we already even know today, if, if you had uh, a big nuclear industry, and then you dumped the nuclear waste into the star, that would actually change the spectrum. We, we would actually be able to see if stars out there had somebody had dumped nuclear waste. So, the star. so we know enough that we would be able to see that it's shifting over time, consistent with a model of people dumping nuclear waste into the star. Well, the the, 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 the distribution of the stuff in the star would be different. Okay. And you know, so that's that's the level at which that's a pretty small change you can check. Right? You should expect them to do very quickly just take apart the star, take apart the solar system, just rearrange it in another large structure, make big reactors, the black holes, just whatever was the most efficient way to arrange and run things, they would rearrange it. A natural star isn't remotely the most efficient way to use these resources. Especially since you know most of the radiation is flying out to the ends of the universe, okay. never to be touched. Uh, like Dyson spheres, or, you know, big, uh, shelters around that absorbs whatever's going on on the inside that re-radiates it out at lower temperatures. But it's still the case that we have not been looking for that long or even that intensely, right? I mean, but, but again, that would only show you. That's only an issue with small things. You expect big. You expect entire galaxies to be rearranged. And people have looked out in you know, galaxy surveys and just not seen that. And you expect not just one galaxy, entire regions of galaxies. I mean, the universe is 13 billion years old, right? There should, should have been time for somebody to do something so big you know, enough. And so that means if, if some civilization that started five billion years ago, even if they only moved at the 20% of the speed of light, they could move out to a radius of two billion light years. And in that radius, they could just rearrange everything. That would be visible. <laughs> that would make some tracks. Okay, so I guess that that's my only defeater. So right. now, of course, you could say, what are what about scenarios under which they don't, they do not use the resources? That is, that would be another explanation of the rate filter. Some way in which they have the resources, they could use them, they could rearrange them, and for some reason they don't. You're looking for a story about why they don't. One story might be some sort of totalitarian government that insists that that just not happened a nature preserve, uh, you know, some sort of obsession with keeping things the way they were. Uh, you know, that's one hypothesis. You call that an explanation for the rate field too, because they do that. You could say, well, they all just navel gaze. They just focus in on themselves. They, they decide that none of them ever want to ex expand, and they even going to prevent anybody else from doing that, because um, they're all really focused on staying really close to each other. You know, that's another kind of hypothesis you can come up with. But by definition, that would prevent them from expanding out and being visible. So the great filter is just literally whatever prevents them from expanding out and becoming visible. It doesn't have to necessarily be death. Okay. It's just hard to come up with scenarios of anything but death <laughs> that over a long time successfully prevents them from expanding. Right. And could you walk me through the argument for believing that it's in front of us? I, I couldn't quite follow in your oh. text. So it was sort of compressed. Well, uh, this is the great question, first of all, is whether the filter is behind us or ahead of us. us right. right. Now, um, the most plausible explanation, honestly, is that it's behind us in the sense that if you're going to look at all the different steps in the history of life and say which one looks the hardest, the very first step looks really hard. So you could try to put most of your weight and say that's where it was really hard. And if that's where it really is hard, then it was really rare to have any life at all. And after then, it's been pretty easy. And that means the filter's behind us and our future is bright. You just have to ask how confident are you with that? Because say it's 90% likely the filter's behind us. 
that means 10% ahead. That means a 10% chance of annihilation. That's, that's big enough to worry about. You yes. should be thinking about what to do about that. So uh, that's one perspective is just to say, even if it is behind us, the, the, problem, the likelihood that it's ahead of us is, is a concern. Um, there's also just a uh, selection effect, uh, you know, through at least one common kind of anthropic reasoning. Uh, universes that have more creatures in them are more likely to, you're more likely to find yourself in a universe with more creatures of the sort you could be. And a universe where the filter is light has more creatures like you. <laughs> because uh, there's this whole huge population of ones before the filter and then afterwards not so many. Right. So that's also an anthropic reason to worry that the future might be ahead of you. Um, and then there's the observation, if we ever find life out there in the universe that doesn't seem to be closely along the path that came to us, then that suggests that it was, it was easier than we thought in the past, and that pushes the probability to being harder in the future. Right. Which means it's bad news if we find life out there right. that, that wasn't caused by the path that produced our life. So, yeah, that's the kind of counterintuitive example you get where Nick Bostrom talks about hoping that we don't find life anywhere, we don't find life on Mars. It would be great to find it all being arid and dead, because right. that means... Well, we, don't, we hope not to find independent life. I mean, if, if if life on Mars came from Earth or life on Earth came from Mars, then it's all the same history. But if it evolved history. along a different pathway... Right, but the, the more independently the origin was, then the more... Likely it is that it's in front. Right, and that, that I thought was one of my contributions. So, intellectually, I've, you know, the Great Fields are just a renaming of the Fermi question, you know, where is everybody? That's not much of an intellectual contribution. I thought it was an intellectual contribution I made to be able to say, uh, more likely something... <laughs> was uh, to, to go through the past, then that's bad news for the future. So that was one of my contributions. And another was a statistical analysis to say, uh, if there are many steps, all of which are very hard, uh, we should expect a certain time distribution in the time delay between them, which is roughly constant, even if the steps have very different difficulties. And that means, and, what, and that should also be equal roughly to the amount of time left on Earth before our window closes. And so then you can use that, looking at our history of life on, to guess roughly how many steps plausibly there have been. So since we may have a billion or a billion and a half years still to go before our window closes, that means you're looking for roughly that size of a step in the past. That plausibly means nothing in the last half billion years was a great filter step. Uh, maybe the origin of multicellular life was, uh, you know, maybe sex or, you know, for the, the embedding of some cells inside others, but uh, other than that, uh, of course, you know, it's quite plausible that life came from elsewhere, Earth. <laughs> the history of life goes past back before Earth, but still, under the scenarios, life would have to come to a place like Earth, and then before the window closed, something would have to finish. Okay. So, do you have any thoughts about how to mitigate existential risk? Mm -hmm. Where should we put our research hours? Uh, you know, the obvious thing is to try. <laughs> To, to look for a problem. Well, that's, that's true. Them. Yeah, step one is just noticing there's an issue and then trying to solve it, uh, right. which is non-trivial. Right, right. So, you know, just the obvious put, put effort in. Try. You know, take it seriously. So, um, don't easily dismiss. Although, one interesting observation to make, and it's important, is that the risk of robots taking over is not something that plausibly contributes to the Great Filter. Um, so, uh, if you worry about the Great Filter, that is not a reason to worry about AI. The because of the statistical argument you made about the windows? No, no, just because uh, it's, it's, there could be a step right now, it's just what, no, not, no time in the last half billion years, but it could be right to be about now to be, could be a great filter step. No, it's just because if a robot, uh, you know, AI takes over and doesn't embody our values, it still becomes visible. Right, so you, you would <laughs> still expect to see somebody out there making paper clips out of galaxies. Or whatever, or they, whatever. they would just be right. doing something, right? right. So, so that the, the fact we don't even see them uh, says that there's a puzzle, and the, you know that scenario doesn't explain that puzzle. Okay. Um, well, is there anything you would recommend, like any concept or small set of concepts that you think are especially useful to understand for? I mean, for somebody like me who's interested in existential risk and its mitigation. Um, in general, there is, a, you know, for any one problem, you have to figure out the level of abstraction that will be the most useful to work on. Um, I'm actually not very convinced that the category of exponential, existential risk is an especially useful category to be working in. Okay. It can motivate you to focus on many other more specific problems. I don't think there's really that much to do at the level of thinking about existential risk in general. That's probably true. That, that's so, fair. So uh, you know, use that to motivate thinking about more specific risks and then focus on more specific risks and analyze those with whatever tools you have. Uh, so in my mind, uh, it's 
it's sort of strange that if you think about our world today, if you think about risks that could happen right now, uh, we don't invest very much effort in really big risks that could destroy the world. Um, maybe we should invest more, but as a fraction of all our effort, it's pretty tiny. If you think about the future, however, it seems like um, at least a majority of efforts are being spent thinking about the biggest things that could go wrong. And you might think, well, that's kind of the opposite bias. Uh, if, if, if we only spend a tiny percentage of our effort today thinking about things that could go wrong today, maybe we should be spending more effort in the future and not focused on things that go wrong, but just thinking about the middle of the case. So I actually think if you want to understand a future or any scenario that's strange to you, your first priority should just be to figure out the middle of the distribution of possibilities. Okay. Not, not to go to the tails. There's, the middle is more canonical. There, there's one middle, basically, and there's a lot of tails. The more dimensions there are, the more tails there are. So there's just a lot more work in figuring out the tails. They don't even know which of the tails to focus on. And it's just easier to go wrong in trying to guess tails. So first, work out the middle of the distribution. Figure out what a typical case in this world looks like. And get that right first. And then start to ask, well, in this middle distribution, what are the plausible tails? But the, the, that'll, that'll be a grounding for you to guess the tails, the tails of the risks, the things that can go wrong. So we have a lot of future scenarios we just haven't thought through very much at all. And I really think our first priority should just be getting the middle of the distribution. Develop scenarios. like a, a portfolio of plausible future scenarios and then just have as good a understanding of them as possible. Like In your, terms of the typical case. Your EM books. So right, it's like, exactly. That's not a disaster book. It's just like, well, if we can do this, then we Just a portfolio of scenarios. And then with respect to each scenario, you can ask, and what, what are the things that could go wrong in this world? Okay. But just starting and saying, what are all the things that go wrong in the future, when you have very little idea what the middle of the distribution looks like, I worry that that's you know, a little early. So uh, it sounds like well, it, that's that doesn't do much to allay existential fears, but it means that a person could have a pretty productive career as a futurist just sitting down with a couple basic assumptions and writing books like the coming uh, age yeah. of EMs and, and just analyzing those scenarios pretty straightforwardly, like not worrying about. So the there's hardly anybody who does that sort of thing, right? And so I definitely would encourage that. Um, now. Uh, I've had some success at my one scenario, and in part that's due to some features of me that are unusual, and I don't know how much you need to be like me to do those things, but I, I will just notice. Um, if you want to take some a limited set of technological assumptions and then work out a whole scenario of a civilization on that basis, well, first of all, you need to know a lot of things, a lot of different fields. Uh, you can't describe a whole civilization if you just know computer science or you just know sociology or something. You'll need to know a lot. And you may just need a whole career's worth of having learned about a lot of things uh, to have that level of expertise to really apply. So that's what I've done in the sense of waited toward the end of a career and, and after learning many fields and then constructed the scenario of an entire civilization. I, I often, you know, but often people most trying to do futurism are 20 year olds who find it very exciting and engaging and they're just often not very well qualified <laughs> to do it. And you often find the 50-year-olds who are more qualified and not so interested. They don't really care. And so, so that's so a problem. It, it might be better like, to organize a Futurism After 50s conference or something like that and just, just get kind of older people who've been in economics well, yeah. for a while. Well, older polymaths, basically. Right. People who, are, who know a lot of fields just and, been and know a lot, a lot, a lot of things. About stuff. And then you say, okay, here's a scenario. Tell, you know, so what work do you it think? out. What work it out. Well, yeah. that's interesting. I, yeah, I actually know a number of people who are on the older side and who have you know backgrounds in finance and computing. Right. And and so contribute meaningfully to something like that. Right. They, they, they are, have the skills more ready to sort of do, do a scenario. That doesn't help me much. I'm 29. Well, not yet. <laughs> you have a future ahead of you. Yeah. Uh, hopefully my great filter is not. <laughs> right. So compared to other fields, of history is known to be a field where it's less about a few key concepts. It's more about collecting a lot of details. And futurism is analogous to history in many ways. Uh, in the sense that uh, you know, you're studying a lot of complicated factors and trying to put them all together. The future is different from the past in that we have less concrete data. So futurism requires you to focus more on theory than mere empirics. So to be a good futurist, uh, you should be like a historian in the sense of collect, know a lot of things and collect a lot of things and understand a lot of areas of life, but also lean more toward theory because you just can't be so empirical. So a lot of people, now that you've said that, it, it strikes me that a lot of people, especially the younger 20-year-olds who are into futurism, are, it's really a form of insight pornography. They just like the idea of all these crazy scenarios. They, they just like neurotech. They like nanotech. And it's fun to think about, but really what they should be doing is mastering you know, a handful of simple concepts or relatively simple concepts from economics that you, you've got to have a, kind of a breadth, well, sure. and then you play it forward in time. Well, just as an intellectual... Um, you know, you, you should ask yourself whether you're focused on yourself as a demander or a supplier. 
Right, that is, as a demander, you're asking what subject am I interested in? As a supplier, you're asking, what can I do? And uh, you know, so for an academic, early in your career, you need to realize you need to focus on being a supplier. You shouldn't focus so much on what subject you're interested in. You should ask, what subject can I do things that other people will value? And accept that other people have the demands they're setting in terms of what will be rewarded. Later on, as you acquire more resources and, and expertise, you can be more of a demander yourself. You have more freedom, say, tenure to choose what you do. Uh, but even then, you should ask, yes, what, what can I do? Or what do I know a lot about? Or what can I learn a lot about? Right? And that should matter a lot. It shouldn't just be what am I interested in. It's also what can I say something about? In order to say something, you need to learn a lot about something. So can you tell us a little bit about some of your other projects? Are you at liberty to talk about them? Uh, well, I, I wonder if we should get back to Elephant in the Brain and make sure we've uh, covered that enough. Absolutely. We went relatively quickly over sure, that. Sure, sure. Um, because uh, one way to say there is, is that um, I have a surprise for people, which is, uh, my co-author, we have the surprise that uh, you know less about your motives than you think in a lot of areas of life. Now, most people, when they hear that, they, see it, they say it sounds plausible, and then, of course, they note, well, what, what's the solution? How do we fix that? As if there would be an easy solution to, to learning about a big new problem. And then they also say, well, this is kind of a downer, isn't it? <laughs> you notice, well, isn't this kind of a negative point of view? Yes, a lot of like analysis in the world is, is, is negative. You know, physicists tell you the universe will, you know, eventually wear down. And chemists tell you you're, you'll die. And most of <laughs> psychology is a huge downer. I studied in right. university; is a huge downer. Right, but nevertheless, the fact that it's a downer shouldn't prevent us from studying. Right. And if we've got this revelation that, that, that a lot of life is just different than you thought, that would seem to be a huge potential for new research and new studying. We do 10 areas of life in our book, but there's at least another 10 or 20 out there that you could uh, also study. So it seems to open this potential, like go take another area of life, ask what's the usual motive, and then collect a bunch of things that are puzzles from the point of view of that motive and ask what other motive could make sense of that. So potentially, there's a lot of progress we can make in the near future taking the same method and applying it to a lot of other areas. And it's interesting that a lot of people nod and say the book is right, roughly, and that's interesting, and they don't seem at all interested in finding out what more areas of their life they might be wrong about, too. Right. And I think that speaks to the fact that uh, the elephant in the brain is the thing we really don't want to look at, and we would really like to find an excuse to look somewhere else and say, yeah, I guess that's right, and just ending the topic conversation is one way to do that. It's pretty remarkable. I, I don't think a person who hasn't studied psychology or been familiar with these ideas can really understand how, I don't know if insidious is the right word, but your, your brain really does have like a, a set of defense mechanisms for preventing you from learning things about yourself, about itself, that you wouldn't like, or that would be maladaptive right. in some way. It takes a tremendous amount of effort to even notice that you're flinching away from yep. noticing that uh, what you're doing is not what you said. You're doing things for reasons you didn't say uh, right. that, that you didn't articulate. But it takes a tremendous amount of effort just to notice that kind of thing. Right. When we were pitching our book, many publishers rejected it, saying, well, this is a downer. People don't <laughs> want to read this. <laughs> even you know, academic-oriented publishers, <laughs> even you might think, hey, we're, we're having this big intellectual revolution where we're saying a lot of things are wrong, and, and there's a whole very different perspective that's right. You might think that that would be enough. <laughs> To justify a book, people will say, well, that's still kind of a downer world. <laughs> of course, that has, you know, you might think people wouldn't want to hear about global warming then. Right. right. I think but that they do want to hear about it, or even about AI risk. So there's a sense in which many downer things are somebody else's fault. As, as long as you can be outraged about them. But, right. but, it, but with signaling, it doesn't work as well because then, mm -hmm. then you just turn around and say, well, you're outraged to signal how virtuous you are. Right, so we actually don't mind negative scenarios as long as they can possibly be somebody else's fault. <laughs> <laughs> then we can blame them and feel right. outraged about it and doing something to counter those evil people and we're the good person studying the day. When the negative news is that we aren't everything we like to claim and plausibly we are at fault, that's a much less welcome sort yes, of negative that's news. that's much harder. And our book can be seen that way, although of course we are obviously telling everybody equally you're all not what you thought you were. Right. And that's not you in particular compared to anybody else. Right. But people do feel sort of personally attacked. I, I like the uh, the paragraph where you're, you list out all the stuff like stealing office supplies and lying to people. And you're and you're like, and Kevin and I well, admit, these admit to doing half of this stuff. You know? Right, right. Nevertheless, that's not the sort of thing people like to admit. Right. Um, so 
are you going to continue this research? Or are you going to push out? Or are you going to move on to something else? I'm sure it'll be part of my portfolio for a while. I don't know how central it'll be. I, I would certainly like to inspire other people to continue. My co-author, Kevin, has gone back to his career as a, as a software engineer in Silicon Valley. So I guess he won't be continuing uh, you know, as, a, as a intellectual researcher, I guess, for, at least for a while. Uh, and so I would, of course, welcome anybody else's help in this area. Uh, but I can understand if people flinch away and they find it's not pretty. Uh, but for I, reasons besides the ones that they actually have. But honestly, I, I have to say, you know, I didn't choose this topic. It sort of chose me. That is, I kept noticing puzzles and, and I just couldn't help but like wonder what was going on with those puzzles. And I spent a lot of my life trying to come up with reforms, uh, ways to uh, redesign policy to be more effective in various ways. And, Puzzles about that are mainly that people are not interested. Right. You can actually identify and create better mechanisms. You can test them in the lab, you can test them in the field, but people just shrug their shoulders and they're not interested. Yeah, you can and use something like a prediction market, but then it example, makes the managers and the consultants right. mad. Uh, and, so, and somehow but, they don't like it. Right. But, but So this is an explanation in my mind for why there's such lack of interest. So if you are the sort of person who wants to reform and change the world and make it better, you should know that this is one of our main obstacles. And so. Even if this is your intellectual priority first, you might realize that getting to the bottom of this may be what you have to pay attention to to uh, be able to do those other things that you want. That's true. And yeah, I am a person, in addition to all the prestige that accrues to me for being a person who cares about you know the future of the world, I actually do want the future to be a habitable place. So I guess I will have to spend some more time thinking about this and, and read the rest of the book. I, I think I'm about halfway through it. I got up through the, the chapter on art, which right. I thought was fascinating. Now, the, the, the simple observation is that many people in history have said similar things. Mm -hmm. We are not the first person to make the observation that a lot of people are pretty hypocritical about their motives. But it makes sense of a lot of things that were maybe right. not obvious. Right, but, but the, the concern is because those people in history said things and then the world continued mostly ignoring them, that can happen to us too, right? So the question is how could we do better? How could we make a mark that lasts longer than these previous wise people in history who have said similar things and who have been forgotten? And so, but of course, there have been things that people have said over and over that eventually people accepted and came to realize and accept, say, superstition is kind of stupid. You know, I'm sure people were saying that for thousands of Sometimes years. Sometimes you just got to say it a lot of times, and <laughs> right. eventually it makes its way to the zeitgeist. Well, there's also just the kind of evidence that gets collected and the kind of arguments and how solid they are and how easily accessible they are. So it still could be possible that this eventually becomes more widely known, but I think for a while it won't be. And our, our ambition isn't really to make sure everybody admits this. That's kind of like just being cruel, really. I think it's more that some people should know this. And maybe people, just policy analysts or people who are most responsible for knowing this, I would say, are policy analysts. People who stand up and say, I know how to make the world better. They should be responsible for looking straight at the world and seeing what it is for the evidence we have. So. If I wanted to be a CEO or just you know run a futurist institute or something like this, and I, I set up a decision market, it turns out I'm wrong about something. I mean, do you have any advice for how to communicate with people who don't understand signaling, who don't understand how perverse the incentives can be when I, I'm trying to sustain a level of prestige that will allow me to continue making good decisions? Well, um, I have a couple of examples historically that, uh, that I think I could give you an idea of how where the future could go. One example is focus groups. Um, focus groups weren't always there, uh, but they have now become a common staple in companies that offer products and marketing. Uh, with a focus group, you're going to bring in outsiders, they will look at a product and react, and you can't control that reaction. And you know you can't control that reaction. So as a manager, you know not to predict what they will say. That would be stupid because quite a long, often you will be wrong and then your rivals will be able to point out all the times you were wrong about what you predicted. So managers have gotten into the habit of not predicting what a focus group will say. Whereas in most other areas of the company, managers are in the habit of expressing opinions because they don't expect to be contradicted. And the problem with introducing a prediction market without changing anything else is if people keep the habit of expressing an opinion on something, say whether you'll make the deadline on a project, and then the prediction market contradicts them, they get embarrassed, and now there's a conflict. So simultaneously with making an organization get into the habit of using the prediction markets, you need to train the managers to be in the habit of not contradicting the markets, not even expressing an opinion on what the markets will say. And so that's why there's, there's a you know, equilibrium adjustment that needs to happen. It's not enough just to introduce the prediction market. You also need to 
change the rest of the Some of the other culture. attitudes and some, the habits and the stances right. that the managers exactly. take as they so interface with the technology. But you can see focus groups happen. Right. So right. it is possible to create information sources that uh, would contradict what an executive maybe would say. Maybe not feedback, maybe something like that? But it's just more the habit of having an opinion. Then. Right. And so, okay. uh, you know, if, if you're just expected to have an opinion about whether, whether your project will make the deadline, then that's a problem because you will express an opinion and the market will contradict you. Um, you'll, you'll look like a fool. And the other example I, I like to use as an analogy is cost accounting. Today we're in a world where we all do cost accounting. And now imagine on a project, you say, let's not do cost accounting on this project. How about that, everybody? That would be interpreted plausibly as saying, could I and you steal on this and we'll just not keep track of that? Would that be okay with everybody? That's not a welcome message necessarily. Right. Now imagine a world where nobody does cost accounting. And there was such a world once a time. You had organizations without much cost accounting. Now imagine, in that world, you say, let's do cost accounting on our project. How would that be taken? That would be taken as saying, someone around here has been stealing. Let's find out who. Also not a welcome message, especially if they have been stealing. Right. <laughs> so it, it needs to kind so, of diffuse. So there's right? multiple equilibria that you can go either way. You see, in a world where everybody does it, you have to do it too. In a world where nobody does it, it's hard. To, uh, it's a Nash started. equilibrium problem, right? right? There's just so, no incentive. So we're in a world change. where nobody does prediction markets. Right. So every time you propose to interrupt, to introduce one, you are interpreted as saying, "People are bullshitting around here. Let's just cut through this bullshit and find out what you guys really think." Okay, not not a welcome message. Right. But in a world where everybody does a prediction market on their project, uh, to find out if they'll make the deadline, that was just what everybody did. And you said, "Could we just not do that prediction market thing on this project?" That would be interpreted as saying, we're going to be late, can we just not look at that? <laughs> <laughs> Which would not be such a so it's, so, it, so it's it's potentially in the long run, it could become an equilibrium just as cost accounting has, but that doesn't help much in the short run. It kind of sounds like a meta downer. It's it's kind of, there's really nothing we can do. We're just going to inject well, this into the zeitgeist and hope that it's sort of... Well, in any one place, you can try to do a trial. You can try to, you know, innovation is all about trying each little place and see what I'm you interested do. in doing that. You know, I'm not I'm happy to help most any organization with concrete real trials. I think that would be I'm, great. I'm much less interested in adding more papers to the pile of abstract mechanisms and, and laboratories right, and things like that. Right, because I've been thinking about trying to do some futurist work and get people together right. and do stuff, and it would just be nice to have some solid predictions from a prediction market about whether or not I'll meet this target or that target. And, you know, the, right. the mechanics are still not that clear to me, but so I, it's, I'm it's, it's, it's quite stories. generally applicable, but it just requires a lot of organizational innovation. So, I mean, another way to think about these things is um, most innovation has many components. Most new systems have many parts. And academics tend to work on some of those parts, not the others. Right. And that means we've got a big pile of part of the innovation that's sitting there, but it's not a whole innovation until you work on the other parts. It's got to be a symbol. You know? And to do the other parts, you basically have to go out into real organizations and just try different variations and see what works and Which what doesn't. Which is anathema when you could just be <laughs> But academics, papers. you don't get rewarded for that, so they're happy to do a theorem or a lab experiment or some right. kind of concept thing, which just describes in general what might be possible. But they don't tend to go into like the messy details of real organizations. But again, that's what you need for most real organizations. That's also true for physics innovations, of course. You, know, you have a physicist who came up with a new material, a new sort of device concept, but Industry actually typically pays a lot more to work out all the rest of the details than that physicists did to work out the original concept. Uh, and that's expensive and time consuming, but that's what it takes to make a real material work in the real world, right. in a real device, etc. You just have to work out a lot of practical details. And that happens in physics and software. We, we already know how that works in the rest of innovation. It's not that different than social innovation. We just have to be willing to do it. it. It does seem like kind of a hard thing to. You have to. It would require a lot of skill to be able to see the whole vision and say, well, we need to get this person to kind of do more of this and these people to work together. Like that's a management problem that's non-trivial of quite a bit of complexity. Sure, but I mean, just the basic formula is you say, you are the team who is going to work on this innovation. Like, hire all the people you need to do all these different parts. Do a trial. It won't work, but do another trial. Just like start down the path. <laughs> you know, we'll give you some sandboxes to play in, and we'll give you some people you can work with to, to test your things out and just start going. That's how innovation works everywhere. Well, um, I think that's everything for now. I really appreciate you talking to me. It was me. great talking. Yeah, and um, enjoy your time in Denver. Thank you.